to say on TLV1. Israeli Interior Minister Gideon Saar has said that he will not accept the country's High Court of Justice's decision to overturn legislation. This law allowed asylum seekers who entered Israel illegally to be incarcerated without trial for up to a year. The court overturned an amendment to the Prevention of Infiltration Law, which would essentially close the Holot detention facility that's in the south that's holding more than 2,000, uh, some call them asylum seekers, and some call them uh, infiltrators. Saar is about to step down, but he says he's going to submit new legislation on the asylum seeker issue before the Knesset reconvenes at the end of October. Saar believes that giving up on Cholot would be a stage of capitulation, that the inevitable result would be the assimilation of the infiltrators into Israeli society. There's also been some very strong reaction uh, against the court decision from the residents of South Tel Aviv who feel that their quality of life has been seriously adversely affected by the large population of, uh, of African asylum seekers uh, among them. With us to discuss the issue is Professor Avi Bell, who is a senior fellow at the Kohelet Forum and a lecturer at Bar Ilan University. Welcome to the show, Professor Bell. Thank you for having me. Um, so uh, Gideon Saar is, uh, again, I guess this is the third time now, tr- going to try to change uh, legislation so that uh, it doesn't uh, violate a decision of the, of the high court. Can you walk us through the, the history of this issue? Because it seems to be bouncing back and forth between the government of the courts now on a, on a regular basis. Uh, certainly. Um, it's a little bit complicated, but the, the basics of it are, are, are this. Um, there's a large number of um, infiltrators, is the legally correct term, um, um, from Africa in recent years. They're infiltrators under the law because they crossed not through a regular crossing. They didn't present themselves to authorities when they entered Israel. And by the way, under international law, you're not a refugee unless you either present yourself to authorities at the border or do so at the first opportunity thereafter. So they wouldn't be, um, they're not refugees under international law either. At any rate, there's a, there's a large number of, um, of infiltrators in recent years from, from Africa, in particular Eritrea, uh, Sudan, and Ethiopia. Uh, the exact numbers are disputed, but uh, we're talking about numbers north of 100,000. Um, there, a large number of them are concentrated in South Tel Aviv, and there have been some crime problems that have been associated with them and some complaints uh, um, from uh, neighborhood residents. Uh, the first go-round of uh, the legislation was uh, an attempt to, um, to deal with the problem, not by uh, mass expulsions of the unlawful infiltrators, but by um, holding them in detention pending um, a country that will accept them the problem with sending them back to Eritrea, North Sudan, and Ethiopia is that uh, Israel does not have relations with uh, Sudan and Ethiopia. And um, Eritrea is, has a problematic human rights record. Okay. So basically there's, there's no way to, to, to easily or simply expel them from the country. They have to be dealt with in some way, shape, or form. Right. And so what we're talking about, both, in both cases, the law dealt with people with whom there's been an administrative proceeding where an expulsion order has been issued, but there's no practical way to send them to their country of origin. Right. So, the, so the, the detention facility was built in the south and uh, and, and is, it was is considered by the government to be at least a partial solution to the problem. The the issue is that the, the court uh, seems for the second time now has refused to recognize that solution as uh, as being uh, legal under Israel's basic law. Correct. Uh, exactly. What um, what the court ruled twice. The, the first time, um, there is a, a possibility of detention up to three years. This go-round of the law had a possibility of detention up to one year. In both cases, what the court said is that it violates the concept of human dignity as it's encapsulated in Israel's basic law, human dignity. Um, it's rather a vague concept, um, and so it's it's not entirely clear the grounds on which uh, the court would decide that any particular policy regarding 
uh, the infiltrators as either valid or invalid. And right. So well, you look at uh, you look at the yeah. declaration by the Interior Minister that now he wants to send it back. He wants to try to create new legislation. You wonder it in order to save quote unquote the Holot facility, but you wonder if the court will will accept it in any way, shape, or form. Is is this a kind of a, a pointless exercise for him to go back to the drawing board and uh, and and try to create new legislation, or basically um, is it just a question of judicial action? Activism that the the court is saying no detention facility will be okay. Well, the court didn't say that no detention facility will be okay. In fact, in the first ruling, it uh, it suggested several of the things that got implemented in the law thereafter, and then it subsequently struck down. So one of the provisions was uh, there is also an open facility, or there are, there are people in the facility who are who are able to leave as long as they report several times a day. That was actually picking up a suggestion that the court said in its first judgment. So in, in this sense, the court really has invited the, the legislature to come back and try again. Um, and so it's not, at all, it's, it's, it's not all, at all clear what the court intends to do next time, and it's pretty much asking for there to be a next time. How do you think just, you know, the, the bigger picture in terms of this is something that the people's elected legislature clearly wants, has voted and supported uh, again and again, and it's something that again and again the uh, the court in in various uh, ways and, and shapes and forms has uh, has said no to? How does this framed in sort of the, the overall uh, conflict between uh between the the will of the people and the uh, and the authority of the courts in Israel. Well, I think the court is overreaching here, um, and um, you've, there's been a, um, a number of cases, high-profile cases, in recent years where the court has struck down uh, legislative action on thin or non-existent uh, uh, bases. It's, it's, it's not the first time even with the detention facility. They struck down um, a private prison facility um, on constitutional grounds, although they didn't point to anything in particular in the Constitution or in the basic laws um, that, um, that was wrong. And you've seen, we've seen in polls over the years that um, um, the reputation of the court is declining. It used to be um, one of the most trusted institutions in Israel, it's still more trusted than not, but its reputation has declined drastically, according to the polls, from uh, support of 80 plus percent to, uh, I believe it's somewhere like 50 something percent these days. And so th this overreaching by the court is, is going to extract a price. Um, it's taking a toll on the reputation of the court, and I think ultimately it will lead to uh, some curbing of the powers of the court. Comparatively, is the uh, Israeli court far more uh, far more activist than the U.S. Supreme Court? Well, um, it's you know, all, but it's very hard to measure these things because activism is not something where we have a, a um, an accepted set of statistical tools. But I would say yes on a number of different uh, uh, measures. So, on constitutional grounds. Um, if, the, if you look at the history of uh, judicial review on constitutional grounds in the United States, there were basically in the first 100 years of the United States two laws that were struck down by the uh, Supreme Court. In Israel, um, and since the, the Supreme Court decided there was a constitution, and there were never actually was a document passed that was called the MCA Constitution, the Supreme Court has already struck down about a dozen laws. Um, so that's far more activist than um, uh, the early years of judicial review in, in the United States. It also has shown much less deference to uh, legislative decisions than the U.S. Supreme Court has. Now, when you get to things like administrative law, where the court is far more activist and has um, original jurisdiction, then there's no comparison. It's the most activist court in the world. Mm -hmm. um, the court doesn't require that uh, parties before it have any legal standing. Anybody can come to the court simply because they're bothered and ask the court to ask to act essentially as a super legislator. Now this and seems that, that yeah, go ahead. No, no, no. I'm just saying that you know this seems to be really a unique case of the uh, the issue of the uh, the Africans. I don't want to put myself on one side of the other by saying uh, infiltrators or asylum seekers or refugees or whatever, but of uh, this particular issue because 
uh, when we're talking about the the laws and and the court, often it's you know on very sort of high theoretical legislative, as you said, administrative issues. And this is something that's really just a you know a day to day affecting people on the ground. It's a very emotionally uh, emotionally fraught issue. I know you don't have a crystal ball, but do you have any idea how you think this is going to uh, to play out? Do you really think the the detention camp will be shut down in the end? Uh, I, I doubt it. I, 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 I'm afraid I disagree with you. I think that the court has stepped into very, very high-profile political matters before on uh, items like um, um, uh, religion and state issues, about the draft of, uh, of, of yeshiva students, right. for Release example. of terrorists, right. Release of terrorists. There's no end to the number of high-profile issues that it's stepped into. Now, to date, it's tended to, to be more populist, in its activism. Its activism has been primarily directed um, on financial matters, uh, forcing the state to spend money, um, and on religion state issues where it sided with the secular public against the religious public. And so in both of those, it's been, let's say, its position has been more popular. In this case, I think that it's taking an unpopular position. Whether it's a, a good position or not is, is a different matter, but it's it's certainly an unpopular one, and that's that's going to it's going to cost something to the court. It can't you can't be this activist and also be unpopular and get away with it uh, with your reputation intact. Well, this has been a fascinating discussion. Thank you so much, Professor Avi Bell, senior fellow at the Kohelet Forum and a lecturer at Bar Ilan University Law School. Thanks again. Thank you very much. 